I have a suspicion that Lawrence Krauss might have something to say about that. Well, I, you know, obviously I agree with much of what you said. It's hard not to, but, but I think the, um, and I, I, and I, I'm at least as much as concerned. I, I, in this political season, have been waste, spending a lot of my time trying to actually affect elections in my own state of Ohio uh, to, and by recruiting candidates who believe in science. As a, as a useful activity. Um, but it, to take the ex wonderful example uh, uh, from Bertrand Russell, um, surely it would, be, it, it would be a waste of, s the teapot around the sun is an interesting example because it, it, it's not worth even talking about, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it would be, surely be an incredible waste of scientists' time to spend a lot of their time trying to explain why there wasn't a teapot around the sun. Instead, it would be a remarkably more productive thing um, to explain exactly how you can predict the motion of the planets around the sun using uh, this law of gravity and that maybe you can understand the future of the universe and the past and, and the incredible things you can learn about it. And so um, the, the, one, the, the way I'd frame this is that perhaps the best, ex if you believe that, the, that a rational world is a better world, and I do, and I know you do, that, that to me, the, one of the best ways to do that is to demonstrate rationality rather than attacking irrationality. Uh, it, it's, it's important at times to do it, and I've done it. Uh, but I think it's much more fruitful in the end to, to, to lead by example. That's the argument I think I, I want to stress. Uh, yes. That's that teapot around the sun again. The now. Well, I'm, I'm not going to defend uh, religion from Sam Harris. But um, I, I did want to say a, little, a word about American religion. I'm a little bit more sanguine about it than you are. Um, I live in Texas. I, I have many friends who belong to denominations uh, that officially teach all sorts of things that I find absurd or abhorrent. But when you really talk to them, uh, which is not so often, about what they really think, you find their opinions are much more woolly. Mm -hmm. And that it may be that 53% or whatever the percent is, when asked in a poll, will say they believe this, that, or the other thing. But when you really get to talk to them, you find their beliefs are not so certain. Uh, in particular, uh, many of them believe that uh, those who, um, excuse me, many of them belong to religions that officially teach that those who do not accept Christ are doomed to an eternity of torment in hell. And yet I find that they don't try to convert me. I mean, they don't make any attempt to convince me that I'm going to be burned in hell for eternity if I don't join their church. And of course, one possible theory is that they don't mind if I spend <laughs> eternity in hell. I want you to. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I'm inclined to think, and, and I find this in talking to them, on the occasions when I can talk to them more seriously, that they're not that certain about it. Uh, but I wouldn't be say that I'm sanguine about the world of Islam. And the obvious difference is um, performance. You know, uh, Larry and I and Sam can talk about these things, and we'll even, if the, anyone ever watches this program, um, uh, be out there, and America, Christian Americans will will hear us saying these things, and I don't really feel that anyone's going to come after us to cut off our heads. But in the Islamic world, and even in Europe, where there are now a very large number of Muslims, you can't be that uh, secure. I mean, Theo van Gogh was murdered for saying unpleasant things about Islam. And um, uh, you know, we've, se we've seen so many examples of this. So I think you know, I don't have much respect for religion, but I think it's important to disrespect, not to necessarily disrespect them all equally. Um, yeah. Uh, and uh, in fact, I think this business of respect for religion, and, and here I'm really just seconding uh, Sam Harris, really is dangerous. I think that it, not only with regard to truth, matters of fact, that Sam Harris talked about, but with matters of morality. That the fact that people take their morality from their religion should not necessarily entitle it to respect on our part if, on the basis of our 
best feelings, it is in fact immoral. Sam, did you, did you have a... Him? Sure, because sure. I have one thing I want to say. Um, <laughs> yeah, there, there are many things. I, the first, let me pick up on, on what uh, Stephen just said. Clearly, we have to distinguish between uh, specific religious ideologies. I mean, my argument is that specifically what people believe really matters. I mean, it really matters that in Islam at this moment, the doctrines of martyrdom and jihad are highly operative and, and give a rationale for, for the kind of behavior, you know, the kind of death cult we see brewing in the Muslim world. And it's not an accident, given the, the theology of Islam, that that's happening. It, it is harder to get that kind of behavior off the ground if you're a Buddhist, or even if you're a Christian at this moment in Christian history, given actually speci specific differences in, in ideology. Uh, so yeah, I don't think we, we, we have to recognize that religion is a word like sport or a word like drug. I mean, there are many different kinds of sports. There are many different kinds of drugs. They don't have that necessarily that much in common. And we will, under no circumstances, have a problem with Jane suicide bombers no matter how we mistreat the Jains. I mean, the, the Jain religion really is a religion of nonviolence. And the more, the more deranged you get as a Jain, <laughs> you become less and less violent. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and there, you know, there, could, there are liabilities. The, the problem with dogmatism, really, uh, I see, is that you almost can never tell how bad its consequences are going to be. I mean, it, because it, it's, not, it's not mapping onto, I mean, dogmas are these beliefs about the world that are not respondent to their consequences in the world and to the, the streams of evidence and argument that should be modifying them. So you have a dogma like, like uh, uh, contraception use is immoral, this, this classically Catholic idea. This seems potentially benign. I mean, it seems like you know, at the, in the worst case, you're going to get overpopulation. But then you map that onto sub-Saharan Africa, where you have Catholic ministers preaching the sinfulness of condom use in regions of the world where AIDS is epidemic to people who have no other information about condom use but the representation of the ministry. And so what I've argued elsewhere, this is, this is genocidally stupid, this behavior. Uh, and yet because, as Stephen points out, because it is coming under the aegis of a person's religious conviction, it is immune to the kind of criticism that we would, we would normally marshal against it. And the, and the one other thing I'd like to say, I think, in, in that the Dan Dennett would say if he were here, is that, yes, there probably is some distance between what people actually believe and what they profess to believe. I mean, you know, we have these astonishing poll results, and then we have to ask ourselves, well, how many people are really sure that Satan exists and leads people to sin, as something like 70 percent of the American population claims to believe? Uh, I just think you have to, you know, you cut, cut the, the poll number in half or in a third. I mean, there's some core people who are really sure. And in the Muslim world, this, there's absolutely no possibility of doubting this because they simply blow themselves up in, in front of the offices of the UN or the Red Cross to announce their certainty. And this is, this is so I think the idea that, that no one's sure, I think, is... is I just want to say one thing. I know you want to move on, but, but, but it relates to the two things that have just been said. The willingness that Steve talked about, which is certainly real, I think reflects a, a more general willingness that's based on, on illiteracy, in particular literacy of uh, scientific illiteracy. There's another poll number that e is m equally, maybe more disturbing to me than the ones about evolution. And that, and that comes from National Science Foundation studies that are done each year of scientific literacy. And every single year since it's been done, f the qu 50 percent of the American public get the answer to this question wrong. Does the Earth orbit the sun and take a year to do it? Okay, 50 percent of the American public don't believe the Earth orbits the sun and takes a year to do it, at least in the survey. Every single year. Now, I know who they voted for, but that's a different issue. Um, the, the, the point is that the will, I'm not sure if you really confronted them about this, that, that they'd, they'd really believe the, that the Earth, that the sun went around the Earth. But that wooliness, that really fundamental misunderstanding about nature, that ignorance is what, to me, allows a lot of the dogma to result. And so it, it, it seems to me that what we, the real villain here is, is it ultimately is ignorance. And the best way to overcome ignorance is to, is, is, is to teach. And, 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 to, and, and that when you have a more literate and particularly scientifically literate public, I happen to believe that, uh, that, uh, that uh, it will be much more difficult for a lot of the things that you fear and I fear to happen. 
Well, I agree. Let me just say, however, that I'm not – the basis for being totally sanguine on that front is uh, rather narrow when you notice people like Francis Collins. I mean, how much more science does Francis Collins need to have on board before he doubts that Jesus is the Son of God likely to return to save humanity? I mean, this is, you know, as many of you, I think, know, he's written this book, The Language of God. It purports to reconcile evangelical Christianity with the last 50 years of molecular biology. When you get to the point in the book where he had his doubts about Jesus removed, you come upon a passage, not I mean, the, the anthropic principle and other things are in there, but when you get to the, the nuts and bolts of why he's sure of Jesus, you get to a moment where he was hiking in the Cascade Mountains and came upon a frozen waterfall. It was beautiful. He fell to his knees in the dewy, in the dewy grass and gave himself to Christ. Uh, now, I would argue that if a frozen waterfall can testify to the, the truth of, of Christian doctrine, it can testify to anything. Uh, and this is not scientific thinking. And it, it gets a pass. I mean, it, it is impolitic for me to perhaps be, even be saying this. Uh, and I would, you know, I would love to say, I would love to be in dialogue with Francis directly about this, but it, it is this kind of thinking comes at a great price in our society because it is, uh, it is now imagined that you can be rigorously scientific on every question and be certain, based on a frozen waterfall, that, that Jesus is, is the, the sole savior of humanity. And I, I think that, that's uh, quite dangerous when we have a president who uses his first veto to block stem cell research, for instance. Yeah, a couple of points there, Sam. Uh, one is that Francis Collins actually was invited. They invited him twice, and he's got an intramural meeting that he's actually chairing. So he, he sent his apologies. He would have liked to have been here. There was, obviously, there was a debate at Time Magazine's offices between uh, Richard Dawkins and Francis Collins, um, which I believe is the subject of uh, the next, next Monday's Time Magazine. Richard, I guess, will be able to tell us about it when he gets here. Secondly, Dan Dennett, those of you who didn't know, had um, a serious... Um, heart issue a couple of weeks ago. He's fine now. He's back at writing vibrant and wonderful articles, one of which will be read by Paul Church and later on. And Dan sends his best wishes as well. Uh, a lot of people, in fact, who were invited will be coming to, uh, I hope will be coming to the, the one that they are missing. Um, but we did invite Ed Wilson. And he said that he would um, love to come, but he was trying to reduce his schedule from insane to merely frantic. Um, so he can't be with us either, but again sends his best wishes. 